What's up guys? Thank you for watching. This is our third episode of Stick Talk and I am super, super excited to uh, be doing this one because uh, I am doing it with another trusted hitting instructor that I've worked with. Uh, this is Richard Skank. We are in St. Louis, Missouri right now. I just got done doing a couple sessions with him before I head out for my season and made a lot of good adjustments, but I wanted to let Rich kind of tell his story and uh, kind of bring light to a lot of what he teaches and kind of inform all the people that are watching a little more in detail about what he what he does. So okay. appreciate you coming on. All right. Good to see you. Uh, you know, Rich, tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of what, what led you to, to be open up your own facility and working with the guys that you work with. All right. Um, I grew up a big fan of baseball as a kid. My dad kind of instilled the love of the game to me. Um, pretty good catcher in high school, went on and played Division II baseball. Um, I never, ever took hitting serious. This is the mid-70s or early, late 60s, early 70s when I was in high school. And by that, I mean, I didn't think there was any special way to swing the bat or anything. You just hold the bat and you swing it and you hope you hit the ball. A uh, small town in Iowa is where I grew up and there was no instruction at all there. You just, you just tried to hit the ball. And I went to college and I played a lot because I was a good catcher. I hit 280 my best season. Uh, my senior season, I was not very good at all. Um, got married, moved to St. Louis, had a couple of kids. I'm playing men's fast pitch softball at the time, still starting to stay active with the game. Um, put a lot of quarters in the, mid, the batting cages, trying to figure things out. I was getting more and more serious about why am I a pretty, a pretty good catcher, but not a very good hitter, and my friends seem to be able to hit, and I can't. And I, I read George Brett's, uh, or Charlie Lau's book about George Brett. I read Ted, Ted Williams' book. I read anything I could find. Um, didn't get any better. And to make things worse, as my kids grew up, they're like their dad. They're good in the field, and they're not very good hitters. So all of a sudden, this thing called the internet comes around, and I was fortunate enough to own my own business, so I had a lot of time during the day to go to the internet websites and read and learn and discuss. Um, so I would do that during the day and then at night I'd go home and teach what I learned that day to my sons. And this went on from about 2000, 1999 or 2000 to about 2004, I guess. And we tried everything. Uh, we were even told we were doing things right, but we weren't getting any better. So finally, I decided that these people I'm listening to don't know much. <laughs> Either my sons are the worst athletes on the planet or the instruction we're getting isn't really helpful. Mm -hmm. And I decided to uh, try to duplicate Barry Bonds' swing. I'm a left-handed hitter, he's a left-handed hitter. He's the best hitter in the game. Um, my theory was, is if I could make myself look like him reasonably well, I'm 50 years old at the time, so I'm not saying I'm gonna hit like him, but in a swing, if I could pull off a swing that looked like his reasonably close, my theory was that I would feel some stretch or some quickness or something that I didn't have in my normal swing. So for two and a half years, between 2004 and September of 2006, I'm in my basement taking swings, videoing them, putting them side by side with Barry Bonds, and then critiquing them. What's my lead arm doing? What's his lead arm doing? What's my rear arm doing? What's his rear arm doing? What's my head doing? What's his leg doing? How's he standing? Is he tall? Is he bent over? Is he wide? Is he narrow? And I just did everything I could to duplicate him. And I wasn't having a whole lot of success until one September night in September of 06. I'm watching the Cardinals play the, the Giants and I'm playing Barry's swing back and forth with my TiVo, my DVR. And for the first time, I started paying attention to his back going backwards before I went forward. And I had a wiffle ball pitching machine in my basement. And I decided I hopped out of that chair and went downstairs and I'm gonna try to see what, how, what he's doing. How's he making this barrel go back there to hit the ball that way? The ball's coming from there, but he's got some kind of depth to his barrel. And within 15 or 20 minutes, I figured out a little bit, at least part of what he's doing. He was snapping his bat and getting the barrel to come around in an arc and I started squaring up almost every ball that came out of the machine. 
Before this night, I couldn't square up many because it was too close to me. My, I couldn't push the machine far enough back. Mm -hmm. So clearly, I was quicker. So my son, who uh, we started this quest when he was in eighth grade, he's now a sophomore in college. That's how long we've been at it. And I called him, I said, Brandon, I think I found something. I'm coming over Tuesday to pitch batting practice to you. So I drove a couple hours to his college. I, uh, after his classes, we went to the cage and I pitched batting practice to him. We didn't really know what the hell we were doing, but we're just trying to figure this move out. And he did pretty good. Um, you know, it's flips. You don't know if it's real in a game yet or not, but it, it, was, it looked improved and we were encouraged. So he didn't get to play much in the spring. I had a senior playing ahead of him at his college, Division Three, And he came home from the summer, and I think it was May 10th of, two, of 2007. And for a couple of weeks, we were working almost every day trying to figure this out. At this point in Brandon's life, he's never hit a ball over a fence. Not in Little League, not in high school, not batting practice, never. On May 24th, 2007, in a doubleheader, Brandon hit three home runs, two doubles, a triple. He, that summer, he filled the gaps with doubles and triples, ended up with seven homers in about 35 games. Wow. And it was just a huge turnaround. Now, the most important thing I need to say is my son was never a pro prospect. He's never a, uh, he's a very average athlete. He's not going to out-athlete anybody. Uh, but that summer, he out-hit the athletes because his technique was so good. So uh, that's how it all started. Um, I had met a guy named David Matranga on the internet. He was a AAA player. He was just like me. I'm a dad trying to find information to help my sons. He's a player trying to help find information to help himself. And we had met, developed a little relationship. Um, and when, when he saw what my son was doing, he wanted to know, so I started teaching it to David. Uh, David had two really good years. I think they were his best years in the minor leagues, but he was already in his 30s, and he never got promoted in the big leagues again. Um, in 2009, I believe, he retired from baseball, became an agent, and he, his job was to recruit talent to the agency. So he's going around to the colleges and the perfect games and the area code games, everything, and trying to see who the best prospects are and trying to get them to sign up with, with their agency, PSI Sports, they're now, now out of Phoenix. So anyway, he recruited Cole Calhoun, he recruited Colton Wong, he recruited Scott Kingery, he recruited Jake, uh, Aaron Judge, amongst many others. So in September of 16, Aaron Judge got called up to the big leagues, September call up and he struck out 42 out of 84 at bats. He hit 179, he did hit four homers, but after the season, David and him talked, and they talked about his swing and how he needs to be quicker, and David told him about me. And Aaron said, okay, let's do it, bring him out. So I went to Phoenix in November of 16, and worked with Aaron twice a day for a week, and then I saw him in January of 17, twice a day for a week, and then I went to spring training in March and worked with him three times. So when, this, when the 2017 season started, I had 23 sessions with Aaron. Wow. And uh, we all know what he did. He hit 330 and 30 home runs by the All-Star break, won the home run derby, uh, hurt himself a little bit. He struggled in July, got it back together, hit 15 homers in September, and uh, ended up rookie of the year and set a rookie home run record, which has now been broken by Pete Alonso. So... In January of 18, after that season, Aaron endorsed me on Twitter and my phone blew up. All of a sudden I went from Brandon's dad to this hitting guy. Mm -hmm. And from that day until de December of 19, so for about two years, I traveled the country putting on clinics and working with players. Got tired of traveling, so in December of 19 I opened my place. So now if you want to know what I know, you can read me on Twitter. If you want to work with me, you have to come to me. That's, that's very fair. Okay. I know. Uh, I know you put out. You know you put out a lot of content, and I'm sure. I'm sure some of the followers on Just Rake. Um, you know they see it, and I definitely. Uh, I mean, I interviewed Justin Gerardo yep. out of Grid NJ, New Jersey. Um, you know, you guys. I mean, he learned from you mm -hmm. uh, the specific pattern, which is called, which has been named high level patterning of the swing. Um, you know, and and I think in hitting, right? It's so filled with. I think it's filled with a lot of like old school heads and a lot of, you know, just uh, not a lot of um, appreciation or a lot of, uh, 
yeah, appreciation for an outsider per se to come in and start kind of revamping. But the thing is though, you never really revamped the swing. Like you just, you created something that has allowed player, all the players of all ages to quicken up their swing, develop a better patterning of their swing. But I think like a lot of the hitting world, they, they kind of think, oh, this is weird or whatever. Yeah. But, um, and that's, one of, that's why I wanted to bring you on because I think what a lot of hitting, you know, a lot of the hitting world forgets is there's a lot of credibility in results. And I think that's where you get a lot of uh, your credibility is from the results that you put out. And, you know, what is it about, you know, what is it about the swing? Like when you're watching a lot of this, a lot of the hitting world, where it's a big leagues, pro ball, or a minor league ball, um, to even the youth, where do you see um, your style um, compared to where what other guys are teaching, per okay. se? The, 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 first of all, I learned what I learned by seeing Barry Bonds' barrel go backwards mm -hmm. before it went forward, and that was totally unusual to me. Um, but Barry won't tell you that that's what he does. Mm -hmm. um, Albert's barrel goes backwards. Manny's barrel went backwards. Mike Trout's barrel went backwards. All the greats' barrel went backwards before it went forward. But yet they don't talk about it. They don't even know they're doing it. it that's my opinion. I haven't talked to all of them. Mm -hmm. But um, what the, the common thing that, that causes that is the position their lower body gets into. So you can teach the snap and the rearward snap of the barrel and that will lead you to the proper lower body movement. Or you can learn the lower body, proper lower body movement and that will lead you to the snap. I don't care which way you take it. Mm -hmm. We're gonna end up at the same spot. But the key is that all these great hitters launch their bat from their back leg. Uh, I call it one-legged hitting. Yes, it sounds a little unusual, but that's exactly what it is. At the moment they launch the bat, they have not shifted any weight, or very little weight, I should say, to their front leg. Mm -hmm. The swing itself shifts the weight. So the question is, do you want to shift your weight then swing? And in that case, the shift of your weight is not really part of the swing. Mm -hmm. It was momentum into the swing. or do you want the power of the weight shift to be actually part of the swing? Mm -hmm. If you want it to be part of the swing, which you should, then you got to swing from your back leg. And when you, when you pull the trigger and swing from your back leg, the weight shifts with the swing. So the power of the shift is within the swing, not prior to it. Mm -hmm. And so all this leads to what I teach is launch quickness. The ability to get your bat up to speed quickly can only come from the back leg. Mm -hmm. And if you're, uh, it doesn't really matter what level you're playing at, but if you're playing at a high level, launch quickness is critical. It is, yeah. Uh, the quicker you can get your bat up to speed, the more time you have to read the pitch. The more time you have to read the pitch, the better decisions you're gonna make. Better decisions lead to more barrels. And that's what it's all about. I agree. More barrels. I mean, Connor, I mean, I haven't really told my story per se, you know, on this thing, it's, you know, the whole point of, of stick talk is to you know allow you know a lot of a lot of the different you know instructors that I feel have you know revolutionized the hitting game and allow them to tell your story and but I feel like a lot of my story has led led me to you know digging into what you teach and saying you know I need to I need to change something up and that's where I decided to go visit you you know I was a guy who same thing good defensive catcher you know you know grew into my size you know I feel like I'm still growing into my size but. Um, you know, was always told by instructors. My dad actually, you know, somewhat kind of alluded to some of the stuff that you teach a little bit about tilting, you know, you know, being quick with my hands, um, you know, getting my lower body more involved, you know, but my dad was a tile setter. He didn't have the experience of baseball. So to him, it was, it was a struggle between, you know, do I tell my son, you know, what I'm, what I'm thinking I'm seeing, or do I let him go to an instructor who is, you know, highly credible or highly touted, um, but what I, what I realized growing up was it was always very handsy, um, you know, hit the ball on the ground type of stuff. Um, and, you know, as I got older, started to get bigger, hit the weight room. And I mean, I'm 180 pounds, 185 pounds in college now, you know, but my hitting coaches are still telling me, you know, it doesn't matter how you hit, just be a good defensive catcher. It doesn't matter how you hit, it's just icing on the cake. And, you know, I'm thinking, okay, well, these guys obviously know what they're talking about, especially at the high, the next level if I want to get to it. So I'm just going to follow them. And then I kind of came to a point where I was like, I'm not hitting. 
I'm going to hit. I'm tired of, you know, just getting little dinky base hits or, you know, going back to the dugout. And um, I think what really changed for me was when what led me to kind of go down the rabbit hole of hitting was of fixing my swing was when the Donaldson video came out. When he, when he, he didn't talk about using his hands, he talked about using his body. And I was like, oh my gosh, like now I'm watching catchers, they're hitting. Mm -hmm. I want to be like that. So, um, it, and I kind of dug into a little bit, but still had no idea what I was doing. You know, I was just, I was just trying to maybe, you know, rotate my hips a little quicker, mm -hmm. you know, get more in my legs or, you know, whatever. But, you know, I started to see a little bit of a power increase, but nothing crazy. And then when I got into pro ball, um, that's what really, when it really hit me. I was like, okay, well, if you want to play for a long time, your swing has to be dialed and you have to slug as a catcher or a slug at any level, but you got you have to slug as a catcher. Um, and I sought out some different people and, you know, felt some cleanup stuff, but still, I think still hit the ball just off my athletic ability and had good hands and good eyes. So that way I can still, you know, get something on the ball, but it wasn't repeatable. I would hit a home run or I'd hit a double or something like that. I'm like, wow, how did I do that? And I would watch a video and wow, it looks great, but I couldn't duplicate it. And that's when I think when, when COVID hit, that's when it really was like, okay, I have a lot of time now. I need to actually make, I need to make a decision or I'm not going to play anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's where I, I kind of started reaching out to you, sending you some video of my swing. And you're like, hey, like, you know, if you want to learn this stuff, come out. Yeah. So it was at that point, I was like, all right, well, I got to make a decision. And so, you know, constantly though, I think we're, we're, what was pretty cool is that I would try to video my swing and compare it to other guys and it wasn't looking the same. And for me, I'm a visual guy. So if my swing doesn't, if I'm looking at my swing and it's not really looking like some of the best guys, to me, I was like, well, I'm not doing something right. So it wasn't until I came to you where I had that aha moment. And I feel like a lot of the guys that you work with, um, you know, in the minor leagues and, and some of the big league guys, you always talk about they had an aha moment where it was like, why didn't I learn this stuff, you know, yeah. 11 years ago or 10 years ago when I started playing, um, you know, and that, that's where, you know, my story kind of leads, you know, into, you know, our relationship is that now I'm a believer in that, like duplicating the swing and getting those fine little cues down really helps. And, um, you know, just kind of, I mean, it, it's pretty interesting how I think a lot of guys miss it where, they're not actually swinging to duplicate. They're swinging just because, you know, just because. Yeah. And then they kind of limit themselves into, well, I just am not a good hitter or I'm just not, you know, I just don't have it. And I think where you've kind of hit the nail on the head is like with how you teach the swing and, and the process of how you teach is that you can get any kid, any kid to yeah. learn it. And, and girls too. Yeah, and, and yeah, softball girls too, for sure. Um, you know, and I, I guess we're like a question that I have is, um, what's that process like when you work with a kid, whether it's a, a minor league guy, whether it's a big league guy or, or a youngster, boy or girl, when they come to you and that pro what's that process like of having to almost rewire what they've learned, you know, of getting their foot down early, pushing their barrel and right. stuff like that. Um, it's a process. Um, everybody's a little different. Mm -hmm. Some people come with severely ingrained habits that are hard to break. Other people seem to be able to break their habits quickly. But what I have to get them to understand is the instant snap of the barrel, the quickness of the barrel. Um, the bat is held in your hands and your hands are on the handle. And if you want your bat to move quickly, the hands have to do something. Mm -hmm. Now, we're also gonna stretch our body and get the benefit of our body. But the sudden snap of the barrel rearward, believe it or not, is proven quicker than the A to B pushing forward. Mm -hmm. I can prove it to anybody who wants to come and, and, and see it. Um, when you snap the barrel rearward, the barrel starts up above your head and you snap it in an arc backwards. So you've got gravity helping you. You've got centrifugal force helping you. You've actually got the leg helping you, the tilt of your torso helping you. And all of that is designed to get the barrel up to speed quickly. Mm -hmm. Now, almost everybody that comes to me pushes the barrel forward. They pull it or push it. And so the process starts with learning to get this knob up, okay? Uh, I talk a lot about if you do the right thing with the knob, the barrel does the right thing. Mm -hmm. And the knob's a whole lot lighter than the barrel. And um, your hands are on the knob, your hands aren't on the barrel, so you have control of the knob. And if you tilt and snap the knob upwards, the barrel will go rearward and backwards like it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. And it'll come around. So 
the process is really twofold. They've got to learn the hand snap, and then they've got to learn the stretch and fire of the one-legged uh, body position. And so when you get both of those right, it comes together quickly. Um, your hand snap may not be really good until your, your uh, stretch and fire is good. Um, and so it's like spinning plates. I've got to get everything going mm -hmm. properly before I get the result I want. But it's a process. You gotta you gotta put the time. In. Sure, I know in a lot of hitting, um, you know, I'm gonna play devil's advocate a little bit because you do uh, you do get a lot of, um, I mean, a lot of criticism for the what the process of what you teach. Um, but uh, you know, play devil's advocate. I hear it all the time when I'm training. If I hear, you know, if I'm doing my 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 uh, my process, my drills. Uh, you know, at, at, um, at the facility that I train at or whatever, I always get the, you know, what the hell are you working on? You know, like, why are you, why are you, that looks stupid, that's not gonna work or whatever. And I'm in my head, I'm thinking, well, I'm actually swinging the bat and I'm actually, and I'm actually doing the thing and I've actually put myself out there to, you know, learn actually this is how, it, what it gets me to do it right. right. So when you hear guys talk about, I mean, I've had it have said to me during my lessons when, you know, I see dads all the time, like, why are you teaching that launch angle crap or whatever? And I'm have to almost have to stand up for myself and be like, that's, that's, that's not at all what I'm teaching at all. No. And, you know, what do you say to guys that say, well, he's doing, you know, he's doing tilt and he's snapping his hands. He's teaching launch angle or teaching you how to hit more pop-ups or, yeah. or fly balls. It's real easy. Yeah. Um, first of all, exit velocity and launch angle are four words that never come out of my mouth when I'm instructing. I'll say quickness a thousand times. <laughs> that is true. And yeah. so what I teach is quickness. And I do have a set of drills that when you look at each drill individually, they're very unusual. They all have a purpose. And when you master each drill and put the benefit of each drill into a swing, the swing's a beautiful thing. Okay? It is, yeah. Nobody criticizes Aaron Judge's swing but everybody criticizes the drills that led to that swing, which makes no sense. Yeah. I mean, we want the swing, right? Mm -hmm. Who cares what it took to get there as long as you got that swing? Yeah. So I'm, big, I'm a big advocate of video. When I work with a player, I will take video of the swing and I'll put it side by side with Barry Bonds or Manny Ramirez or Albert or Mickey or Ted or Mike or somebody. And that leads my instruction. I look at the barrel path, I look at the one-leggedness, are they shifting their weight before they swing or not? And you'll find that duplicating video is far more effective than measuring the metrics. Mm -hmm. uh, the minor leagues have been full of players for hundreds of years, or a hundred years, or however long the minor leagues have been around, of people who, in their batting practice, hit the ball over the fence over and over and over again. Obviously, that's a good exit velocity number and yet they can't hit in the game. Mm -hmm. So what good is that exit velocity number if you can't hit in the game? Mm -hmm. Those guys who have that exit velocity number without launch quickness are not gonna play very long. The guys that can generate some exit velocity but have launch quickness, they now can catch up the fastball, the best fastball. They can also learn to control their load so they can, they're quick even for the off-speed pitch. So, I have found that duplicating the swings of the big leaguers leads to your potential. Mm -hmm. You'll be your best you can be when your swing has the same characteristics, same visual characteristics as a big leaguer. When you have those same visual characteristics, you will have the quickest swing you can develop. If you've got the quickest swing you've developed, you've reached your potential, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, it's, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm a, I'm a believer in it. I mean, I, like I said, I put myself out there and, you know, I'm a believer in it. I mean, I, I might, I've never been as quick and I've never been as, I've never slugged as much as I have. I mean, last year I had almost 20 doubles and almost 10 home runs and that's the most, you know, I'm planning to do it, you know, have a better season this year. But, you know, that was a big thing that changed for me was like, wow, I, for the longest time, I felt like stuck in the mud. I felt like I was just, you know, never going to hit the ball very far, never going to hit the ball as hard. And I think that's a big thing is it's just more barrels, more yeah, consistent more barrels runs. and quicker. Um, I don't care where the ball goes. Yeah, no, for sure. It, yeah. it goes right at somebody, I'm not happy, but I barreled it. I did everything yeah. I could do. Exactly. If it goes out of the park, I'm happy. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, that was the thing is like, I had to, you know, I felt it for myself, and it's like, wow, like, I, I feel a lot more in control, feel a lot more uh, disciplined at the plate, and I feel like I can hit better pitchers, better pitches and better pitchers. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think they're, you know, I know, and kind of to translate it to a topic where, 
you know, we talked about this a little bit yesterday was, you know, there's a big emphasis on the mental game of hitting and there's the biggest, the big emphasis on mechanics of hitting. And in my opinion, I feel like a lot of mechanics that are taught, especially in the Twitter sphere, Instagram, whatever, it's, it's all, it's all just blah, blah, blah mixed together. And now some coaches spewing out what he heard about, you know, what some other guy said, but it's not really getting to the root of the, of the, of the swing and how to actually change, create a, a different result. Um, but, but, uh, but the mental game and the mechanical part, but what I've found is that when I, um, and you can, you can, you know, attest to this is when I'm locked in mechanically and efficiently, and I can actually see the, see the changes and, and the duplication and stuff, I feel a lot more confident in my mental game when I step in the box yeah. because I feel like I'm ready and I don't have to necessarily worry about that mechanical factor. Now all I got to do is lock into my approach. Right. And I do see, like I said earlier, there's a disconnect I feel like with that where guys are like, no, don't worry about mechanics, just works on your mental. But I feel like you can't have one without the other. Uh, in, in my opinion, um, the mechanics, great mechanics, launch quickness mechanics, allow your approach to work. Mm -hmm. Allow your approach to work the best it could possibly work. Mm -hmm. Approach is important, don't get me wrong. It's nice to know that uh, the pitcher has these pitches and he throws this pitch 50% of the time or whatever and the situation of the game and, and, and all that. If you have launch quickness, if you can get your bat up to speed instantly, then you have all the you have more time. Mm -hmm. The more time you have, the better you're going to be at allowing your approach to work, mm -hmm. getting your approach to work. So, um, something that I hear on Twitter a lot is I hear people say something about timing. If you have good timing, you can hit, as if mechanics don't play a role in timing. Mm -hmm. um, good timing comes from good mechanics. If you don't have good timing, you're left with, or I'm sorry, if you don't have good mechanics, you're left with just your athleticism, your athleticism's ability to time a pitch, a fastball or an off-speed pitch or a slider, whatever. But when you have good mechanics, you're not relying just on your athleticism, you're relying also on your mechanics. So you have both. You have good mechanics, you have athleticism, and that greatly improves your timing. How can, how can you be, how can you not improve your timing when you're the quickest you could possibly be. Because now you have more time. Yeah, more time. Yeah. And now, now your timing is going to improve. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I run into a lot is when I get a hitter that is, is really learned what I teach, the first, the first thing they have to do is recalibrate their timing. Mm -hmm. In other words, they're so much quicker now that they got to let the ball travel more before they pull the trigger. Yeah, that's something I had to, yeah. And that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Where do you, see, where do you feel like the... Um, I mean, like I, I mean, I, I, like I said, I commend the hell out of you because you stick to your guns. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's a lot of hitting coaches that are like, I do this, but I also dabble in this. And you're like, no, this is what I teach. This is how I do it. And whoever wants to learn from me is going to get all of me hundred yeah. percent. And you know, if you're going to, if you're going to, you know, endorse me as, you know, if you're a hitting coach, and you're going to endorse me. Like you got to teach what I teach. Right. And I, I respect the hell out of that because I feel like I said, guys dabble in a bunch of stuff just to kind of pat each other on the back and, maybe elevate themselves if they don't really have any results yeah. to back themselves up. But where do you see the hitting game as far as um, uh, where it's flawed, you know, beside uh, it's mechanically flawed for sure in the way it's taught, but where do you feel like the biggest hole is in the hitting game when it comes to um, what you teach and then what other guys are out there doing? Do I think, I think that if, if you, if uh, the biggest mistake everybody makes, they don't understand how to control the weight, how to stay back. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I mentioned it earlier, if, if you can stay back and your weight shifts with the swing instead of prior to the swing, then you have, I often talk about for the snap of the barrel is way quicker than most people think. Mm -hmm. So you've got the speed and the quickness of the barrel snap. You've got the speed and quickness of the stretch and fire snap of your leg. Mm -hmm. And you also have the weight shift, all three of those things happening instantly as you launch the bat, they're all within the swing. They all happen before you hit the ball, or as you hit the ball, I should say. And that's just a, 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 an, a, an amazing quickness that comes out of that. Mm -hmm. But when you shift first and then swing, it's not part of the swing. All you have is your athletic ability at the end. You don't have the, the mechanical advantage of the swing. And this is what 
people don't understand is, is there's a huge mechanical advantage to what I teach. And by that I mean, there's a stretch that snaps. Um, I'm gonna give you an example here. Yeah. When I swing good, I'm resisting this barrel, and when I, re I give up the resistance, the barrel snaps. Mm -hmm. I can make this barrel go a lot faster like this than I can just like that. Mm -hmm. My wrist is doing the same thing, but it's snapping out of resistance is way quicker than my wrist can do it by itself. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens when we stretch and fire against our leg. We coil our hip against the leg. The leg wants to go the other way, so we've got a rag ring like uh, load going on in our leg. Our hips coiling counterclockwise, our leg wants to go clockwise, there's a stalemate going on. Mm -hmm. And when we finally pull the trigger, that bursts. It bursts with uncommon speed and quickness. It bursts faster than your leg can move without bursting through resistance. Mm -hmm. And that's where the quickness comes from. So two things, they, the, most people don't understand the weight shift and they surely don't understand working your body against each other so you get this stretch and snaps. And when you have a really good swing, like Aaron Judge last night, his swing is so sudden, it happens like a pop of the balloon. It's like one sudden burst. There's a load that goes on, and then boom, it's over. Mm -hmm. And that's launch quickness. That's what makes a difference. For sure. I kind of, I mean, I, I want to kind of dive into like a, some of the stories from like some of these guys that are, you know, in the big leagues right now. Um, you know, just kind of, you got any stories of just kind of how, what they've said to you after you've worked with them? Because I feel like, I feel like a lot of kids, they see Aaron Judge or they see, you know, some of these other guys that you've worked with and they go, well, he's only doing that because he's six, seven, whatever. And to me, it's like, well, you're not looking at the right things. It doesn't matter if he's six, seven or like Scott, five, ten or five, eight. Um, they're swinging the bat a lot differently. So I kind of want to, I want to emphasize like what stories you got when, the before and afters of with Aaron, Scott, Manny, whatever, right. whoever else. So Aaron was 6'7", 280 before I met him. Mm -hmm. He was 6'7", 280 after I met him. Mm -hmm. He couldn't hit the ball before I met him. Now he can. Mm -hmm. Launch quickness made the difference. Um, I think that the best season he had in the minor leagues was 20 homers. Mm -hmm. um, and his first season in the big league, he hit 52. With Scott, Scott was in the minor leagues and I didn't know him at the time, but I've come to find out that he was struggling barreling balls and was top spinning a lot of balls. And he came to our my second workout with Aaron in, in uh, January of 17, that's when I met Scott. And he instantly felt the quickness of the snap. And he was in double A that year and he hit 24 home runs, I believe it was, and he only hit five the previous year. Hit 300 or 290 something, um, filled the gaps with doubles and just had a hell of a year. Mm -hmm. And the next spring, that was, yeah, that was 17. In the spring of 18, the Phillies offered him a big league contract before he ever stepped fiddle on a big league field. That's awesome. So Jose Vargas um, was playing in the independent league, in the frontier league. He came to a clinic of mine in November of 16, and he really did well. And um, I don't know how things work, but he ends up in the Mexican league, mm -hmm. which is a little bit better, at least financially. You it's, can get, you get paid a little it's, better. It's like AAA, AAA level of baseball. I mean, yeah. and his first season, he hit 290 with 25 bombs, I believe, and a 920 OPS. Uh, Jason Vossler, who's now up with the Giants, he just uh, uh, had a couple homers in the last week or so. Uh, for the last several years, he's been in the minor leagues, and every year he hits 290 with 20 some homers and 920 OPS. Mm -hmm. He was with the Cubs. He's a third baseman. When he was with the Cubs, he was blocked by Chris Bryant. He got traded to the Padres. He's blocked by Manny Machado. He has got traded to the Giants. He was blocked by Longoria. Uh, Longoria. Uh, now he's called up. He's got an opportunity now. So he's, he's deserved an opportunity for several years. Now he's getting it. Um, just a lot of players that have, that have put up numbers. Some of them are blocked by the, the big league club has a player mm -hmm. at that level already. Uh, but I will say the greatest accomplishment of everything I've done is what I did with my son. Mm -hmm. Um, five eight, maybe slightly overweight, not obese by any means, but not an athlete at all. Mm -hmm. And that summer, when he out hit every athlete on the field, was was amazing. Yeah, if that is the best um, endorsement of what I teach, I think that's better endorsement than Aaron Judge. Although I appreciate Aaron. Judge. No, no, for sure. I think yeah. it, it kind of goes to show, like, 
you know, it's very easy to, I think it's, especially today, it's, it's really easy to like, um, if you're a coach out there to lock into a, you know, a guy who's already good, who, you know, has that blue chip talent, already aware of his body, kind of doing the things that you teach without even knowing that he does it. And it's easy to lock into that guy and be like, oh yeah, I'm his hitting coach. And everyone's like, woohoo, but there's really no like actual method to the teaching what he teaches. But um, I think it's pretty cool how you can take, and I think this is what makes um, your way of teaching a lot more credible as well, is that you're able to take a kid from all, a kid who, like you said, your son, who maybe wasn't athletically as, as gifted as the, the highest guys, and he's now he's out hitting them. Mm -hmm. That's something I took pride in too, working with some of the kids that I work with in the off season, is like, hey, I'm not gonna get the best guy, because the best guy's not gonna wanna listen. Mm -hmm. He's already doing well. I'm gonna take the kid who's struggling, who's willing to be vulnerable enough to be like, hey, I kinda wanna learn this stuff, because I'm, you know, I have nowhere else to go. And then they then they start raking, and then they're like, oh, wow. And then everyone's like, wow, how did he start doing that? It's like, well, because he changed. Number one is changing his mechanics, changes confidence. Right. So um, whatever yeah. whatever God given gifts we were given mm -hmm. by our parents through the through the reproduction uh, system, we're stuck with. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can improve the best we can, but we're limited by that. Mm -hmm. um, if you develop the swing that I teach, it's my opinion that you will play at the highest level you can play at. Mm -hmm. It may be college. I think anybody can play college. It might be Division three. Yeah, but if you yeah. learn what I teach, I, don't, I think anybody, I mean, if you have any kind of athleticism at all, you can play in college. And But it might be minor league, it might be major league. All any of us can do is become the best we can be, and wherever the chips fall from there, we all are satisfied. I can't tell you how many guys I've had that have learned the swing, have done really well at the minor league level with the swing, but because they're already 30 years old, they're not gonna get a chance to be a big league, mm -hmm. a big leaguer, but they're thankful and pleased and at peace mm -hmm. that they figured it out. Yeah. Now, yes, yeah. what if this kid would've figured it out when he was 12? Mm -hmm. Or this, this guy I'm talking about. Yeah. If he would've figured it out when he was 12, maybe he would've been a big leaguer. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? For sure. So. Absolutely. Uh, what's the, can you tell us the Manny story? The Manny, which one? Manny, uh, oh, my the, phone rings? Yeah, oh, your phone rings, that's a good story. So. It's May, April or May of 2018. I'm on my patio, we're barbecuing, about to have dinner. My phone rings, I say hello, and he says, this is Manny Ramirez, I don't like you. <laughs> I said, why? And he said, I saw a video of you on the internet and you said I didn't know what I was doing. And I stopped you right there because I know I've never said that. Manny's yeah. one of the best <laughs> right-handed hitters ever. My favorite, yeah. And so I stopped him right there and I said, whoa, I didn't say that. What I said was, you could really do it, but you're not good at verbalizing what you do. You're not good at instructing what you do. And he started laughing. And he said, that's exactly why I called you. Because you're the only one that I've ever heard that could verbalize and explain what I did. Mm -hmm. One thing that's really interesting that, um, of what my association with Manny, and it really kind of proves what I teach. David Ortiz, I think, came for the Twins to the Red Sox. And David went up to Manny and said, teach me what you do. And Manny said, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to teach you what I do. Yeah. And he said, David, come to the cage and watch me every day. And that's what David Ortiz did. And I'll be damned. David Ortiz became as good as Manny. Had a pretty good year. Duplicating what you see. You don't need the, the hit, hit tracks. You don't need the rap soto. You don't need the blast motion. Mm -hmm. You need the video camera. And to watch somebody... You may not understand why he does what he does, but I don't care, duplicate it. Mm -hmm. and as soon as you duplicate it, you'll understand why he does what he does. I feel like the human the, the human element to it is, I think, something that's uh, powerful, you know, where your eyes don't lie, where, yeah. you know, you if you buy in a little bit, even if you don't have all the resources, if you don't have necessarily the the verbalization of it, if you you're, if you use your eyes and you try to use your try to make that mind body connection, at least you're in the right spot. Yeah. I feel like that's where a lot of guys sometimes get a little bit, to, uh, in my opinion, I feel like I get a little bit uh, annoyed or um, frustrated is that, well, I can't do that. Yeah. I can't do that. I can. I'll, I have this guy and I work with him and I'm, I'm all right where I am mm -hmm. at. And um, and I feel like that's kind of, it's kind of, you're kind of selling yourself short. So I feel like if you, know, if you really try to sell out to it, even just making the attempt, I feel like you've said that before, even if you're just making the attempt to learn how to snap your barrel, yeah. learn how to be a little more one-legged, you're at least in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. As, well, I'll give you an example. 
there's numerous kids, and one of them that I'll make, I don't know the names, mm -hmm. but Victor Martinez for the Indians, his son. Mm -hmm. Barry Bonds, his dad was Bobby Bonds. There's others. What do you think those kids are doing when they're at the ballpark with their dad? They're watching. They're watching and they're imitating. What do little kids do? They yeah. imitate you. Yeah. I had a carpet cleaning business one time, and I'd answer the phone at home, Cardinal Carpet Care. And sure enough, my son, who's now 38, probably five or six years old at the time, had this little orange and yellow coupe car that they walked around in. Yeah. And he would drive over here and he would say, Cardinal Carpet Care. He's imitating his dad. Yeah. What do those kids do? They imitate their dads. And some of these guys hang around the baseball field with their major league dad. They're doing what I did, mm -hmm. and not with video or anything, but just by feel. Yeah. And I, I don't remember the young kid's name, but I remember seeing his swing. Victor Martinez's son was amazing. Mm -hmm. His swing was amazing. Yeah. Um, duplicating the movement, you don't understand why until you do it. And as soon as you do it, you'll feel it. You'll feel it. The yeah. quickness that comes from it is uncommon. Mm -hmm. It's um, supernatural might be a little strong, but it, it along those lines where you can't swing the bat this quick without doing the the resistance, creating the resistance of one body part against the other body part so it snaps like this. Mm -hmm. When you figure that out, it's a game changer. For sure, yeah. And I haven't had anybody come to me and feel it that doesn't love it. That doesn't mean they can't duplicate it the next day when they're gone because it's a process you you have to learn yeah but it is so good that they keep fighting for it they keep looking for it they know it's right yeah they've never felt anything like this before they know it's right that's where hitting has like become yeah. fun yeah. actually in my opinion and I, some other teammates that have that i've bought into this too is that now it's fun it's fun to hit yeah now because like oh i pulled off that a little bit or oh i felt not as quick now it's a constant Tug and pull, tug and pull to make sure that you're you're at your best. And Get the recipe just right. Exactly, yeah. That's yeah. no, cool. You know the ingredients of the recipe. Mm -hmm. You know what you got to do. But you can't add more salt. When it says just a teaspoon of salt, you don't want to put a tablespoon in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you don't, when you get it right, you're feeling really quick. You don't want to muscle up because mm -hmm. now you're going to be so quick. Exactly, so yeah. So you got to keep the recipe right. Exactly. Rich, can I have you demonstrate a couple yeah. things just to like, um, just to, so that way some of the kids or some of the other players that see it, um, kind of what what it means uh, turning the barrel, snapping the barrel, and what that looks like compared to a push and how a lot of times coaches are like, hey, we're gonna, um, you know, just take your hands right to it, take your hands right to it. And these kids are like, okay, I'm doing that. But what you teach, you actually are taking your hands to the ball, but you're creating speed. Okay, doing. so the barrel turn is basically holding the bat perpendicular to your, your top hand forearm and making it turn perpendicular to this forearm. Here's the forearm, there's the bat. I'm supinating my top hand. I'm turning my thumb from in to out, in to out, okay? And the barrel goes rearward when I do that as compared to pushing it forward. I don't know if you can hear this on the camera right now, but the whoosh sound that it's I'm it's making when I when you do it. push it forward is right here. And the whoosh sound that I make when I do this is back there. Aaron Judge says, Rich, when I get my barrel up to speed right there, if I'm late, I get a base hit apple. If I'm on time, I go gap to gap. And if I hit the barrel there, I hit it 500 feet, okay? So the quickness of getting the barrel into the zone right there is far quicker than trying to get the barrel into the zone by pushing it forward. Mm -hmm. I only have to go a small distance right here to be in the zone, but if I'm pushing A to B, pushing my barrel A to B, I've got this big distance to go to get there, mm -hmm. and then I have a tendency to leave the zone quickly. But when I get my barrel in the zone right there, it's in the zone this entire distance, mm -hmm. a good long distance. And you're not short to yeah. long through. And your knob is actually going down to the ball. Yes. You're, actually, you're not well, trying to create a big no, loop. You're, I, you're creating a, a I'm not a launch angle. Yeah. I don't yeah. talk about launch angle. Mm -hmm. In fact, we swing down. Mm -hmm. When we're in our stance, the barrel's over our head. When we hit the ball, the ball's there. Somehow that barrel went down. Okay? It goes down by turning it down. It doesn't go down by pushing it down, mm -hmm. okay? When you make this arc, the barrel started there and it ends up right there. It actually goes up through the ball a little bit naturally. 
but you're actually swinging it down. You're trying to get to here as quick as you can, but when you get there as quick as you can, the barrel whips right there and then hits line drives. Yeah. So what, you shouldn't be hitting pop-ups. What about on the high, on the high pitch? High pitch, the okay. Here. So go back to this relationship with the forearm to the barrel, 90 degrees, might be 80, 85, might be 95, but on a high pitch, it comes out like this, still perpendicular to my forearm. On a pitch down the middle, it comes out like this, still perpendicular to my forearm. On a low pitch, it comes out like that, perpendicular to my forearm. So the adjustment is made by the angle of this forearm. There's the high pitch, there's the middle pitch, there's the low pitch. The arm itself may move a little bit, the body's gonna tilt a little bit also, and that's how you adjust up and down. It feels like you're doing the same thing every time you swing the bat. You're supinating this top hand around this forearm, and it, sometimes you do it at a high, high level, sometimes you do it at a medium level, sometimes you do it at a low level, but this move here is the same at whatever level you do it at. Now what about the weight, you talk about the weight shift? The weight the shift. It's about being one-legged. Here's what most people do. They shift, put their foot down, and then push the bat. That's what a lot of big leaguers do. They're athletic enough to be big leaguers. Their technique is not high level, okay? Mm -hmm. So what we need to do, we need to go forward, but we've got to stay back. How do you do that? This is forward and forward. This is forward and back. The whole time I'm going forward, when I'm doing it right, I'm coiling and I'm staying on my back leg even though I'm going forward. As compared to this, where I went forward and I just fall or collapse or crash to my front leg. The importance of keeping this foot off the ground as you go forward, that's how you stay back. If you keep your foot off the ground, you're gonna stretch your back and you're gonna stay back and then at launch, everything goes into the ball, okay? It might take you a while, but if you start looking at big leaguers, you're gonna see all of the, all the greats move forward in some fashion like this, where they're coiling as they go forward, their butt is going around to the pitcher. No, you can't tell, but my shoulder isn't going with my butt. My butt is going, but my shoulder's not. If I get my shoulder with me, I can't see the ball. And I get a long loopy swing when I do that. So don't confuse the coil. The coil doesn't bring the shoulder, the coil brings the butt around. And the coil and a little bit of sit is how I stay on my back leg as I go forward. Okay? And that snap of the hands, it's, it's at the same time as the... Okay? As and then when you go to swing, we want this move of the torso, this tilt move, as compared to rotation, we want to tilt, and this is what they make fun of me the most on the internet, because I'll admit, it looks weird when I demonstrate it by itself. But this move right here is the boxer's uppercut move, which is the most explosive thing your body can do. You get tremendous quickness and power out of this move. When I do it with a bat, that looks like I might hit a pop-up, but that has nothing to do with where the barrel goes. The barrel's gonna go where I showed you. So I'm gonna tilt extreme and hit a high pitch. Okay, I did this, but I snapped the barrel at a high pitch. Now I'm gonna tilt extreme and I'm gonna hit a medium pitch. Okay, I did this, but I hit the ball right there. Now I'm gonna tilt extreme and hit a low pitch. I'm gonna do this and that. The tilt, which unleashes the body, it unloads the body, unloads the leg, has nothing to do with where the barrel goes. So anybody who sees this and thinks you're gonna hit pop-ups do not understand. Mm -hmm. They don't understand what's going on. For sure. Okay? Um, yeah, no, I appreciate you demonstrating that. Um, I think that's important for people to see because like you said it, it sometimes gets confusing, but, or at least, if you're not here doing it, mm -hmm. you're trying to do it on your own, you see the drills and then you have some other outside or your coach going, I don't do that. It's just, you're going to pop stuff up. And in reality, you're actually creating the pattern to right. be able to get to every single level of pitching. Yeah. Um, man, Rich, I appreciate it yeah. um, very much. I appreciate our time hitting together too. I'm excited about this season. Um, 
Where uh, where can people uh, find you on Instagram, Twitter? What's your teacher man nineteen eighty six on Twitter and Instagram? Um, yeah, that's where you find me the most. Direct message me if you want. I'll give you my uh, phone number if you want to talk about coming to visit me. We can talk. As far as uh, when people come when people come to uh, when they start messaging you, what's what's one thing that they need to be prepared? To, to, to realize and be able to be prepared to when they do message you, whether it's, hey, Rich, can you take a look at my swing? Or, hey, what are you, what are you doing? Like, what's okay. this stuff? Um, I get a lot of videos sent to me. I get a whole lot of requests. Will you look at my swing and give me some advice? And I get to most of them. I always get to someone who's already been to me and worked with me. Uh, I get to a lot of others. I'll tell you who's last on the list. The people who are last on the list are the ones where I have to go to Google and download your swing. I can't just click on it and see it. Uh, people who send me slow motion video are last on my list. Slow motion video is the cause of most analysis mistakes. You have to be able to figure out where the barrel was launched in order to properly analyze a swing. You can't see that in slow motion video. In 30 frame per second video, you can come within a reasonable certainty of exactly when the hitter launched the bat. That means you, you now know when the launch was, that means everything before that was loading, and everything after that is swing. And if you play in slow motion, you don't know where that dividing line is, mm -hmm. and you can make any slow swing look like it was good, oh, yeah. Yeah. when in fact it's long and slow. For sure. So send me full speed video. I can always play it frame by frame to slow it down. But I try to get to everybody, I can't get to everybody. If you send me one swing at one pitch instead of a whole at bat, I don't want to watch you take five, six pitches and then get the swing at the end. I, I got, I, I've only got so much time and I want to get to as many people as I can. So the quicker you can make it for me, the more likely I want to get back to you. Sure, what's uh, the teacher man in 1986? Uh, what's your plans for the summer? Um, I'll probably travel a lot. I'm with Aaron every couple weeks. Um, people come to me. I just doesn't it really doesn't matter summer or winter with me. Uh, I stay busy during the baseball season. I travel a little bit more because I'm traveling to my pro players. Mm -hmm. But uh, it seems like it's the same year round for me. For sure, you do any clinics in the off season or um, anything like that? Anything lined up? I've slowed down on the clinics because I don't get enough one on one time with everybody who comes to the clinic. Mm -hmm. And when they go home and they have a little struggle, there's nobody there to help them. So I don't think I really, the clinic was helpful. Um, I now prefer people to come to me and spend a couple days with me, get three or four lessons in with me at one time. Uh, say one lesson today, two lessons tomorrow and fly home, or two and two and fly home. You're gonna get a good understanding of what I teach. And from that point, we can communicate with video and we, can, we know what each other's saying. But in a clinic, when I've got 12 people here, and I don't get any real one-on-one -on -one time with any of them, when they leave, we still can't communicate real well. We, ha we haven't had enough time with you individually yeah. uh, to make it effective. Yeah, so I, did I may do some clinics. I, don't, I like doing coaches' clinics mm -hmm. uh, where I can work with coaches and help them learn so they can teach their players. Mm -hmm. And a coaches' clinic works best when a coach brings a player. Mm -hmm. And now I'm coaching both of them. And now when the player goes home, he has what he remembers, but he also has his coach to help him uh, improve. For sure. So, favorite favorite baseball team? Uh, Yankees, I guess. <laughs> I mean, you're I, saying you're living in St. Louis, not yeah, the Cardinals. I do like the Cardinals, but uh, I watch Aaron Judge every night. For sure. And so I'm getting a little uh, emotional about the Yankees at times. For sure. <laughs> favorite uh, favorite food at the ballpark? Uh, probably a bratwurst. Bratwurst? It, 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 the right bratwurst. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some of them are not good. Um, favorite favorite National League hitter right now? National League hitter. Um, who am I supposed to be thinking of? Juan Soto. Juan Soto? Yeah. I'm not even going to ask you who your favorite American League hitter is. We know <laughs> that. Um, young, young hitter right now in the game um, that you see that has it, who's going to tear it up this year, you think? Whether it's one of your guys or a guy that does do what you teach, but maybe already has it ingrained, who do you think you're, you're eyeing on right this year? Like a rookie or a second year guy? Yeah, or? rookie, second year guy. Yeah. Um, I've 
I really like Cronenworth. I don't know if he's been around two or three years, but I like watching him. And the Padres, yeah. He's very simple at what I teach. I've never worked, I've never worked with him, mm -hmm. but I can see what I teach within him, and he's very simple, very short, concise, and it works. For sure. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, I appreciate it. Um, like I said, Rich, appreciate your time. Um, I know we have one more session together, and then I head out, but just appreciate you taking the time to you know give a, an authentic look at what you teach and um, you know and just kind of you know giving giving people a, a, a tool that they can use and a resource that they can they can use to get their swing better and um, you know that's the whole point of doing this is yeah. to is to give give back to the game and leave it better than we found it and I think one of those things right now is the swing you know there's yeah. a lot of chaos right now and I feel like you've uh, you get you're you're given a, a a necessary um, piece to the swing where people can nail it down right away and, and stay with something. So Very good. appreciate it. All right. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Thank you.